in the template, so I'm going to add one more. Give it a name and then route it uh, through the effects, oops, uh, through the effects track for the keyboards. Mm -hmm. There it is. I'll uncheck that and just move it over to the same column as the other two. Now I've got room to move my three keyboard tracks up there. Just taking time to make sure they're still lined up. Uh, next, we'll have our lead vocal, and then the dry version of the lead vocal. Um, I went through one in one of the breaks, and I muted all my <laughs> all my dry vocals, but we'll need to do that again once we get them onto their real uh, tracks. So, uh, lead vocal is going to go here. The lead vocal is also referred to as harm one or harmony one. And uh, that's because we have three parts, and when you're, um, when you're playing the game, you can either play in solo mode or harmony mode. And when you're in harmony mode, harmony one takes the lead, and then you usually have uh, uh, one or two harmony parts to go with it. So then the dry version is going to go down here on the dry box harm one track, and those are... Those are muted by default in the in this template here. So now I've got harmony parts two and three, and since I've got more than that, I'm just going to have to create additional tracks for these um, other harmony parts to sit on, and then go through and listen to them later in the process and decide which parts are the interest, most interesting parts that we would want to have be singable in the game, and then everything that's not is going to become uh, essentially part of the background. So just because there's so many of these and they all have almost the same name, I'm going to do a slight zoom in vertically so we can start um, so we can see the names pop in. So we've got Harmony 1 and then its dry counterpart and then the same thing with 2, 3, 4, and 5. And what I need to do up above is create places for them to go and then I'll be able to drag them into place like we just did for keyboards. Now um, on the vocals, we actually have separate effects tracks for each um, vocal part individually, uh, because in this case, we're typically not cutting in between them like we would on uh, the guitar part or the keyboard part. These are usually running kind of over the top of each other, so they uh, we control all their levels separately for the most part. So what I'll do is I'll basically just make some copies of this last one here. and just update the names. And then I need uh, places for the dry versions to go as well. Okay, so now I'm ready to actually go ahead and drag these into place. So I'll grab one, two, three, four, and five, and pull them up above here.
And then I'm going to grab the dry versions and bring them up too because of the spacing. I'm just going to do them one at a time. Now, interestingly enough, even though these new vocal tracks that we created were copies of the Harm 3 part, and that's routed through the Harmony 3 effects track, Reaper is smart enough to go ahead and adjust that, so now these are actually routed through those copies that we made, and we can check that by just um, bringing up the routing matrix again. And uh, taking a look at those vocals tracks, and yeah, they're all they're all um, being bounced through the correct track so that's a nice really nice feature so now we can just get rid of the last of our empty track holders down here so the two last things we need to do here are make some adjustments to the events track and the beat track and then we need to go ahead and render out all these stems uh, so that they'll be ready to pull into a copy of this reaper file which we're going to actually use for charting and then we'll leave this one laid out the way it is so that we can come back and make uh, changes to the mix later if we need to. And then those stems that we render out are also going to get loaded up into Magma, uh, which you'll see in the next segment. And that'll be how we actually package the song up and uh, transmit it to the console and upload it to Rock Band Network when it's finished. So the B track is very simple. If I double click on it to open it, um, it's essentially just MIDI notes that represent a downbeat and then the, re the rest of the beats in the measure. And normally on a song that's in 4-4 time, the only thing you ever have to do to the beat track is lengthen it or shorten it, depending on how long your song actually is. In this case, because the song's actually in 3-4 time, uh, we, we do have to make some adjustments to it, because you'll notice it's set up with one downbeat and then three remaining beats. And so essentially what we have to do is go through the song and adjust that. So you see the 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, and just continue doing that for the whole song. So I'll finish that later. Um, and then the last thing we have to do in the beat track is figure out where it should end. And the template has it authored out to, uh, to about this far. So we're going to need to make it a little bit longer than that. So let's listen to the track. And we'll sw actually switch over to the events track. And there's two text events down here in the text event area that we need to adjust so that they fall where we want them to. The first one is called Music End. And that's a cue that we put uh, somewhere around the end of the song, essentially at the moment where if, like, let's say Clara was performing the song live, at what point at the end of the song would the audience start to cheer? And so you want to kind of think about it in, in those terms, because it's not necessarily the moment when they hit the last note or the moment when, you know, the final sustain has fully died away. It's usually kind of somewhere in between there. So let's uh, just listen to it real quick. Okay, so she hits a harmonic right at the end there, which finishes the song off nice and clean. And so that's probably about the moment where the audience would start to cheer. I might give it a beat or two after that, just to give them a second to process that the song is finished and start to clap. It happens here in the um, bar 219, and what we need to do is actually extend this track out, and I can either just grab the end of it and move it right here in this view, or that's the same thing as if you're out here in the main view and you just grab the trailing edge and just move it. So I'll just move it out here so it's the same length as our other tracks. And while I'm at it, I'll, I'll do the same thing with these. So you can see the uh, template put these two text events here. This is just kind of their default location. So then I just want to move it to... So I'll probably have them start cheering right there. So I'll move music end there. And then end usually happens a measure or two later depending on how fast the song is moving. And what that does is it triggers the um, game engine to go ahead and yank the note highway off the screen 
and transition into the sort of post-song animation sequences that you see the band members going through. So you want to kind of think about um, from the moment when when the uh, audience kind of flares up to when you'd actually want to see the, the highway go away. Because if it happens too quickly, it starts to feel weird. And if it takes too long, it starts to get awkward that the note highway is still scrolling along and nothing's happening. So I'd probably put it right about here. And then usually what will happen is you'll try it in the game and you'll get just get a feel for the timing and whether it seems natural or not. And this little area is selected up here because this is where we had put our last tempo map node. You can see if we scroll all the way up to the top here, that's the last one that I did, uh, which is good. And so what I want to do now that I know where end is, end is right here at two, the third beat of measure 221, which means I'm actually going to need to remove that last node. So I'll just click it and delete it because you can't have any MIDI data any charting or tempo map nodes or anything after that end event or you'll get an error when you try to compile the song in Magma. So now I'll come in here to the beat track and just continue the beat by j literally just copy pasting until I get up to right before um, the end of the song So basically, I'll just get rid of that note, because this is right where the um, end event was happening. So those two tracks are ready, and now all I need to do is go ahead and render out my audio stems, and then I'm going to make a copy of this Reaper project that I'll use for charting, and load up my rendered audio stems into that one so that they're separate from these versions in here. So in terms of rendering out the uh, audio stems, let's take a quick look at Magma just to get a visual on what it is that we're after. Because in Reaper here, we've got way more stems than we're actually going to be feeding into the game. So sometimes it helps to just take a look at uh, where they're going to end up. If we launch Magma and then look on the audio tab, this is where we'll eventually be uploading the stems themselves. So for um, the drums, we've got uh, the kick drum, snare drum, the rest of the drum kit, bass guitar, one stem for the playable guitar part, one stem for the playable keyboards part, and then any non-playable guitar and keyboard parts are going to get rendered as part of the backing track. And then for vocals, um, we'll have one stem with uh, the complete vocal in it, including harmonies, and then dry versions of the singable harmony one, two, and three parts. So let's go back to Reaper and render those out so that they'll be ready to bring into Magma. So up here in the drums track, I'll just go ahead and click the solo button to solo the kick drum. And when I solo that, it's actually, um, actually going to give me the output of this effects track that it's routed through. So that's kind of a nice feature of Reaper is that I don't have to remember that there's that relationship and also solo that one. I can just solo that one and it will, it'll give me what I'm supposed to get. So then to render it, um, I just want to go up here to File render. So these are pretty much the default settings we're going to use on everything except for the dry vocal tracks. We're rendering at 44.1 kilohertz, stereo, 16-bit, a wave file. And then I just want to browse to the location where I want it to render out to. So under my audio stems, uh, the four mixing folders where I was pulling from to go into Reaper, now I'm going to use this mixed folder to create my output. And I usually like to number them just because that kind of makes them pop up in a certain order when they're uh, when I'm looking at them in the file structure. And then I click Save. So now it's pointed to the right file path, and then I just hit Q Render, and then that goes away, and now it's basically ready to render whenever I tell it to. So then I'll uncheck that, solo the snare drum, do the exact same thing. And then this is going to be the same, so all I'm going to do here is just um, just give it a different name. Hey baby, it's easy to believe. 